Hello again. Welcome back to Microdot. A while back I was joined by guitar legend and founder member of seminal punk band Slaughter of the Dogs, Mick Rossi. Mick supported the Sex Pistols at the legendary Free Trade Hall gig in Manchester when he was just 17 in 1976. So he's got an incredible story to tell. And I'm fortunate enough to call Mick a friend, having been a lifelong fan of his band. So this interview isn't an interview as such, it's just two, two old mates having a chat together and I think it comes across like that. So without further ado, here's me having a chat with Mick. Mick Rossi, welcome to Microdot. Thank you very much, Brian. It's been a long time, my friend. It has been a long time. When, yeah. when did I last see you? God, what? Six, seven years ago? Was it really? In Manchester, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get on to where we met later. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, as a lifelong fan of, of the, the band Slaughter of the Dogs, it's just an honour to have you here. And a lot of my viewers probably won't have heard of, your, of the band. Mm -hmm. A lot of people my age obviously will. Right. Because I would argue that any, any self-respecting punk rocker my age or a wee bit older worth his salt would have been a massive Slaughter of the Dogs fan. Mm -hmm. Because, again, coming at it from a, a fan myself, I would argue that along, obviously the Pistols, Clash, Damned, Buzzcocks, Slaughter of the Dogs, that's yeah. your top five, isn't it? I mean... Yeah. We I were right there at the beginning. That's, that's the, sure. Exactly. Yeah. Right so, at the beginning. So talking of the beginning, how did it all begin? Well, basically, four lads from a council estate in Withenshaw. Growing up in, in Withenshaw, Manchester, it was a very uncomplicated life because it was all about your street. And a little gang would congregate on the corner of the street. But as one got older, what was on offer was nothing. It was just bleakness. And I couldn't see myself working at the co-op or, 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 or uh, you know anything like that. No, there's not, nothing wrong with that, but um, I was very influenced by the glam rock period, as everyone else was um, of my age. I remember being in the council flat and seeing David Bowie do uh, Starman on Top of the Pops, and he looked right into camera, and he goes, and I have to phone someone, and I picked on you, and he pointed right to camera. It's a legendary moment, and I actually thought he was pointing at me. <laughs> he was. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, like another, you know, gazillion million other people. So that was the first moment that music resonated with me. Something happened. I thought I was looking at an alien, this guy with no eyebrows, and then I gravitated to, to the blonde guy with a Les Paul. I didn't even know what a Les Paul was, but I knew I wanted to do that. It was weird. You know, sh a bolt, uh, a wake-up shot like that really informed me that maybe music was the way. We could do something, you know? And so it started like that from our roots of glam rock, loving glam rock. We formed a band and then my brother, who was I think 19 at the time, he came down to rehearsal, heard this racket and says, you know, I'll manage you. And that, that's how it started. Because that's an important point, isn't it? A lot of you, you didn't join a band because of punk, you preceded punk. That's right. Uh, which I think is very important here, you mm -hmm. know, because a lot of bands that followed on were mimicking or aping the original punk bands. You, you came before a lot of that. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, look, look when punk happened, we, we, it was like pop-up. There was a band there and a band there and a band there. So then the whole nation, there, there was this movement of punk bands. Yeah. But we, we, you're dead right, we were pre-punk. We didn't even know what punk rock was, yeah. you know? Um, and we were just kind of, we were acting on pure instincts. And I, I think at anyone's, uh, at the start of their career, you start emulating your heroes because you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I wanted to be Mick Ronson and uh, Muffet wanted to be Charlie Watts. And Howard Bates, uh, I, think he, I think one of his favorites was uh, Entwistle from The Who. So you emulate those people and eventually that drops off and you find who you are yeah. as a musician. You find your style, your sound. Um, so it was pre-punk and we were just acting on pure instinct. But the glam, uh, uh, the glam rock music of that time was seeping into our DNA, you know? So what year was the band formed? I think 75. Wow. I mean, literally, we were doing labor clubs. I was probably 11 or 12 when I first picked up a guitar. My mother took me to Moss Side, which is, was then a real rough neighborhood. 
and there was a, a, a second-hand store, and she bought me an acoustic guitar, which was six quid, and the action on it was like that, but I, I learned to play on that guitar, and it was a big commitment for my mom to do because we were really fucking poor, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was a tin bath in the living room, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, 75-ish, I think. Um, but the, the one thing that happened with, with Slaughter and the Dogs is we started to write songs right off the bat. I don't know how it happened. It just started to happen. Um, so we were always very conscious of trying to do our own material. And I think being honest, because we weren't good enough to play anyone else's material. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know how to work songs out then, other people's songs. So, it, yeah, it was well, well pre-punk. Um, we were just snotty street kids doing street rock and roll. So obviously the, there's the seminal gig with the Pistols in um, July of 76, but you'd obviously, you were doing well before that though, eh? We were doing labor clubs. I mean, um, my brother Ray, um, he got his money to do our first demos. It's actually a funny story. I mean, you know, we were, as I said, extremely poor. He was 17 or 18. So he went round in his transit van and nicked all the, the iron grids, you know, the drainage grids on the, on the street. So around Withenshaw, every, there was missing all these grids. And so he loaded them up on his tranny van, took it to scrap metal, weighed it in, and that's how we got the money for our first demo time. Brilliant. Now that's punk rock, man. <laughs> Before punk rock was punk rock. So we, we, we were doing labor clubs between the Frank Sinatra impersonator and Bingo. Yeah. And it was a shock to the system to them seeing us play, you know. I remember once, I think it was Bernadette's in Withenshaw, Working Men's Club. And uh, it's like, we've got four bandits backstage. What's the name again, lads? And we're going, Slaughter the Dogs. And he went, please welcome the slaughtered dog. <laughs> anyway, we, the, it was one of those when you had to do two sets. And we were like, all our best numbers are for the last, you know. Mm. So they, they said, we don't want you, man. You, you know, they paid us off after, <laughs> after the first five songs. We're like, no, but our best songs are, you know, to come. So we did labor clubs and, and did that circuit for a while. And then Ray, uh, it was a very bold move uh, for, for us to do at that time. He hired out the Forum Withenshaw. Um, it's a very fake, still there today. It's a Forum Hall. I think it holds maybe three or four hundred people. And we were we had a, a good local following following that would follow us around. So he rented that out, and uh, I think we had about a couple of hundred people in. And it was amazing. And we got Tony Wilson off the telly yeah. to introduce us. Did you really? And I remember he turned up with a handbag, flares and clogs. And I'm like, fucking Tony Wilson off the telly. No way. And he introduced us, so things started, and this is pre-punk, things started to happen for us um, in an organic way. And I, I, you know what, Brian, I think there's, there's a great beauty in, in naive, being naive because you've got nothing to judge it on. So we were just naive little kids. Our manager was just working on instinct too and we were forming who we were as we went along, you know? For, funnily enough, um, I mean, obviously, I, I, I know where it came from, but for everybody watching, whilst the name of the band is as punky as you can get, again, that's a glam rock influence, isn't it? It certainly is. It, it came from, I was a huge Mick Ronson fan, and a huge David Bowie fan, as I just said. So the name was an amalgamation from Slaughter on 10th Avenue, which was Mick Ronson's first solo album, and Diamond Dogs, David Bowie, yeah. and Slaunt the Dogs. And it, and it does say the ultimate punk rock name, though, doesn't yeah, it? Which yeah, is yeah. quite handy, considering what was to come. Yeah. So um, you've done this landmark gig in Withenshaw to 300 people. Mm -hmm. How did the Sex Pistols thing come about? Well, we didn't know who the Sex Pistols was. Um, we used to wait at, at news agents near, the, near Manchester Airport for the sounds and melody makers to come in. But I'd go up there on my bike at four in the morning, and as soon as you, sounds or NME, those great mag, uh, magazines, we would buy them and just kind of, you know, devour it to see what was going on. Because mm. now we were like, we were a band. So we wanted to see who else was out there. And we first came across the Pistols. I think they'd done... 
think they did, did Paul Raymond's Review Bar, which was a strip club in London. Yep. I think they'd done that gig pre, pre the Free Trade Hall. Um, so we found out who they were, and then we, we knew they'd done a gig in Manchester Free Trade Hall a few months earlier uh, with the Buzzcocks. Um, and I think there was about 30, 40 people in there. But they certainly shook the foundation, because this, this band was, you know, they meant business, man. Mm. It was fucking ferocious and brilliant. Um, and our manager managed to get a hold of, Ray, uh, managed to get a hold of Malcolm McLaren, and, uh, and said, look, we're a local band, we're doing really, really well. Uh, why don't we, we heard you guys come in, you know, we're snotty little kids, and uh, uh, maybe we should promote this gig together. So that's how it came about. And then uh, Ray, he was driving a Mini, had no tax and no MOT. And uh, I, uh, you know, I went with him to the printers and picked up the posters. And we went in there and the guy showed us the poster. Ray had designed the poster, the poster and paid for it. And I saw that Slaunt the Dogs were above the Sex Pistols. And I was like, Fuck, what, what have you done? He goes, it'll be all right, trust me. I'm just gonna bring it in here so we can, you can actually talk with it. So here's a copy of it, because if it was an original, it'd be worth... A lot of money. Do you want to hold that to camera? Can, is it? Right, then. So As you can see it here, what we've got is Exhibit A. It's a Stradivarius and a Rembrandt. That's yes. What we've got there. We have Slaughter and the Dogs here, and the Sex Bills is there. God damn it, there's no mention of the Because I said this morning, because obviously we knew you were coming, and I, I pulled that out, because that poster is on the wall of my office. Oh. Yeah, I've not just done that because you're coming. That's on the wall of my office all the time. Right, and I just right. took it down this morning because you were coming. And I, I'd never thought of that before. I got a minute. It looks like Slaughter and the Dogs are headlining. I know. And there's no mention of the Buzzcocks on there. It was, listen, it was a scally move. Should I put this down? No, no, you're all right. Okay. Keep talking. It was a scally move. It was a, it, it was a brilliant move by my brother. Right. Because... Oscar Wilde once says, an idea is not an idea unless it provokes thought. Right. And boy, did that provoke thought. As soon as the pistols turned up, they were like, what the fuck? <laughs> Malcolm was like, you know, Malcolm McLaren, when, when I first saw him, he was like the Scarlet Pimpernel. Mm. And my brother was like a Mancunian artful dodger. Mm. And it's the first time I'd seen leather pants and purple slippers. And that's what Malcolm had on. And there was a, you know, a, a bit of a discussion about this. And, and I think, I, I don't know what, how Ray resolved it or if he ever did, but I, I think they saw that it was a cheeky move and just like, you know. But it, I mean, again, it was just a... Were there many people there? It was packed. Was it? It was fucking packed, man. And I mean, there's been many books written about, mm. I swear I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everyone in Manchester swears they were there. And I think if, every, if you count everyone who says they was there, there'd be 800,000 people. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I was there and I know what happened. Yeah, well, fortunately um, I wasn't there, but... but it was, and it was a quid to get in. Yeah, a quid. It's a legendary gig, man. I yeah. mean, I think this gig really, it was on the cusp of change. And I think this particular gig changed the landscape of Manchester musical history, mm -hmm. guaranteed because what it showed, certainly Mancunians and, and young kids, that there's something happening here, and change can happen, and you can have some sort of future uh, through music. So what can you tell us about the gig? I just knew something special was going down, and this was a real moment of change happening right before our very eyes. First off, I remember seeing the Sex Pistols sound check anarchy in the UK. And I was standing at the side of the stage and John had a cold. And then Steve hit the first chords of anarchy and he had a phaser on, phaser pedal. I didn't even know what, because I was so young. I didn't know what a phaser was. I didn't even have, have a Gibson, I had a CSL copy. So I'm looking at Steve, real Gibson with this weird sound. So he starts up the anarchy thing and then John had a cold, so he takes out these lyrics on a snotty bit of paper. And then Cookie just goes, doom, 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 and John goes, all right. And I was like, fucking hell. <laughs> because they were like dangerous, sexy, fucking provocative, dirty, everything all rolled into one. And it shook my very foundation. 
So that sound check, again, a switch hit off, you know. Um, so gig time, it was packed, and we had a lot of our fans there who were following us. And, you know, we were still emulating our heroes. I, I wanted, you know, I had the booth on here trying to look like Mick Ronson, trying to dress like him from Slaughter on 10th Avenue. And uh, we were doing covers as well. We were doing Suffragette City. And I remember Paul Morley, who used to work for NME, I think, at the time. And he, he, he had a Hawkwind T-shirt on, real long hair. And when we did Suffragette City, he ran to the front of the stage going, ah! with his hair like this. It was a strange moment. <laughs> and then Ed Banger in the nosebleeds, he was our guitar roadie. And I broke a string and I, I, I said, I, you know, I need a, a string fix or another guitar. And Eddie had brought his guitar. So he disappears, brings back his guitar and he's been bottled. So there's all claret all over him. And he reckons one of the pistols roadies had bottled him. And then it went off. There was a bit of a ruckus, a bit of a fight, um, and that was that gig. Oh. <laughs> but what, what we did after that, um, we went back to rehearsal, and the arrangements on some of the songs, they were long-winded, and, you know, and we just thought, fucking right, man. What did we just witness? All right, we're going to shorten that song. We're going to turn that up. We're going to cut that frilly bit out. We don't know what we're doing. And all of a sudden... Seeing that the pistols took a shift on our songs that had been riding, he went and then cranked up really high. Was there the bitch was there? Uh, we had them there, but they weren't what they were, so we were chopping down arrangements and making them tighter and really trying to follow the blueprint of the sex pistols. So, following on from that, then the recording career began obviously, and the first single was with Rabid, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, um, and you were the first. Release on Rabid as well, weren't you? Yeah, we were, we were actually the first band in Manchester to release an independent single of the punk rock time, you know? Before the Buscocks? I think so, yeah. Right. Um, and it was on uh, Rabid Records, and it was a Tosh Ryan who used to do the fly poster in around Manchester at that time. Um, I think uh, he'd seen us, and... Uh, uh, it was a, a smart of him to do because he said, we should put a single out. We'll do it on a label that I will form. Um, and we were like, yeah, yeah. We just said yes to everything. We didn't know what we were doing. And then he says, and there's this guy called Martin Hanna who's going who's gonna to produce you. Wow. And we're like, who is he? So I see Martin. He's got curly hair. I'm like, fucking curly hair. Fucking hell. And then and he had clogs on. He was like a hippie. But he was such a nice guy. And so we'd never been in a proper recording studio. And so Martin really listened to the both songs, The Bitch and Cranked Up. The vocals were done in the toilet. Um, and my guitars were done. It was one of those studios where it's, it's, it's almost a studio, but not quite. The board was great, but I had to record in, in, a, in a, like a broom cupboard or something. Um, but Martin is responsible for the, for the punch and attack on, on our debut single. Because, again, we didn't know what we were doing. I, just, I, I, mm. I hadn't really gone into guitar sound. E even though I, you know, I wanted to sound like Mick Ronson, I just didn't have the capacity at my young age to e even get my head around that. So I think we've cranked up. Um, we did it all in about cranked up and the bitch. I think we were in and out in three hours and it was mixed. In three hours. I was. I remember being at school, and we had to uh, take a piece of existing art and copy it, but blow it up, sort of scale it. Right. It was a scaling exercise, and I took the back sleeve of Cranked Up, which is the dog's head with the drooling off the That's bands, right. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. Is the bitch. And I was 14 when I did that, and basically <laughs> got told off by the teacher, like, "You're not allowed to bring that stuff into this classroom," sort of vibe. Because that's what it, I mean. That's in the days when, you know, even. I used to put stickers over the back of um, Ian Jury records because it, it, it had been some clever bastards in case my mum saw it and I don't um, let her see a copy, never mind the bollocks of the end. Oh, right, right, so, right. So, you know, that sort of thing. It was, again, it was from a fan's point of view, it was just, this is incredible, you know, because yeah. you weren't supposed to do it, you know, yeah, you weren't yeah, supposed yeah. to have it. But yeah, the back sleeve of cranked up with that dog's head. It's, it's amazing now, to, yeah. if, you know, where we're at now in 2023 to think that 
a dog's head on the back of a... Sleeper. I think it was more the type of the, word, the bitch that, oh, wor that worried him, to be honest. That was offensive. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> yeah I can see that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was mimicking your sleeves when I was still at school. So that's... But that... I mean, I often say we wouldn't be here now. I wouldn't have done all this artwork had it not been for your band and pistols and all the rest of it. That's what inspired me. Well, I, 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 that's very nice you say, Brian, but I disagree. I, I think... This was your vocation. I think you're well, you know, brilliant at what you do, and it's it's in your DNA, you know. But it was certainly brought out. Or, no, I tell you what. I tell you what, it, what. What gave me the the idea, the notion to do it? Punk right. rock did, and, and what it was was the fact that it demystified the whole process for the first time. Yeah. The man in the street could do it. Exactly. That's what it said to me. Yeah. I thought, yeah, yeah, fucking yeah. hell. Because up until that point, the the industry, well, as you well know, sure, had been run by big corporations, yeah. men in suits, yeah. you know. Working class guys from council estates in Manchester and Wigan could not do this. 100%. And, yeah. and punk rock enabled it. Yeah. So that's, so that's what I mean when I wouldn't... Yeah, I, know. I totally understand that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what it did for, for all of us. It, it, uh, it, it, it informed us that we didn't have to, you know, try and do it through, through the corporate channels where you're making music by committee. Exactly. Oh, yeah, or God. you're doing artwork by committee. Or anything by committee. Yeah. You know, I was only saying that this morning. You know, yeah. the, the, the whole corporate structure, this faceless, soulless, run by numbers, yeah. decision by committee, oh, my does my head in. Yeah, me too. I, I hate it. Me too. There's a fr friend of mine, uh, he was a, a head of A&R at EMI Records for many, many years. And um, I remember this is going back a bit when I lived in London, and um, he just says, oh, it, you know, it, it, we've got a new, um, you know, fucking boss. And I said, who is it? And he fucking come from a tyre firm. <laughs> That's it, Goodyear Tyre. He's yeah. now running EMI yeah, exactly. Records. Exactly, it's a commodity. Yeah, it's what just, the yeah. fuck does he know about music, yeah, yeah, you know? So uh, the punk rock was, was crucial for saying, you know what, you can do it yourselves. Yeah. You can do it yourself, good or bad, you yeah. can do it yourselves. So whilst that was my influence, I know um, you wanted to talk about Mick Ronson being a massive influence upon you. Yeah, very So much what can so. you tell us about Mick? Well, first of all, you know, in my opinion, Mick is one of the greatest guitar players ever. Um, you speak to anyone of, of, uh, of our generation, Steve Jones, Slash... Um, God, it, they're all Rono fans. Because everyone filtered through the glam period. Mm. Um, and there was Bowie and the Spiders. Um, so I, I think Mick was a genius, and, and, and I think he was an absolute angel of a man. Um, had a profound effect on my life as a, as a youngster. Um, I got to know Mick. Uh, this is as Slaunt the Dogs was just... Forming. We were doing little gigs, you know. And so I was too young to go and see Bowie, and I missed all that Ziggy stuff because I was just too young. So, and I was still too young to see Mick. But I remember when Mick came out with Slaughter on Tev Avenue, that tour, he played Manchester and he played Sheffield. So I thought, fucking right, I gotta go, I gotta go. Um, so I bunked off school, saved up, bought a ticket, Went to the, uh, uh, and the irony is it was at the Free Trade Hall that, yeah. that I first saw my hero and I ended up doing the Free Trade Hall, you know, many years later or a couple of years later with, with this gig we were talking about. So Mick comes on and like any youngster back then, you rush the stage, you know, and I'm like, Rano, Rano, and he goes like this. <laughs> and on all my mates I was with, he was like, it was, it was me, he pointed, no, it was me, you know, and so... The show was amazing and uh, waited outside the backstage area just to get a glimpse or try and get an autograph. And he was ushered out very quickly onto a coach and the coach drove off. And I was really deflated just to get a glimpse of him because back then they, they, it was different, man. They, they, they were larger than life, these people. I mean, they were really rock icons and, and uh, untouchable to a degree, you know. And so next day is, uh, the next gig is uh, Sheffield. So get a coach up, me and a couple of friends, get a coach, because we couldn't afford the train. I think it was like 50p on the coach or a quid. Um, but the last coach was 
uh, too early. Uh, I mean, it would be the time that Mick was playing in Sheffield. So we sleeping bags. We were going to sleep on the uh, station floor Brilliant. and get the um, get the train back the next day. So again, Sheffield. Mick comes on, run to the front of the stage. Rano goes like that again. I'm like fucking, it was me. Now he pointed at me. So backstage area. He's ushered out on the coach. But this time I thought, fuck it. So the coach disappears, and I'm running after the coach. One block, two block. All the fans had kind of dropped off. So I'm running with a couple of buddies, just running. Run out, coach in the distance. Traffic lights, run after another light. All of a sudden, the coach stopped. It's about 11 o'clock at night. I was in Sheffield, never been to Sheffield before. The doors go, and Ron out goes, come on then if you're coming. And I was like, so I nervously walk on the coach. I see Trevor Balder. I see Mike Garson. Woody's not playing Woody Woodman. He's got Aisley Dunbar. And Mick says to me, I saw you in Manchester. And I swear to God, Brian, my fucking chest went like... <laughs> and so he, um, he says, uh, uh, it's the end of the tour, so there's a party back at the hotel. Would you like to come? And Susie Ronson, uh, who created the, the Ziggy Stardust cut, uh, that was Mick's girlfriend at the time, and they married later on. But she was responsible for the Ziggy cut for David. And um, so she was like, oh, you're so cute. You know, and we were like 12 or something. I mean, I showed you the photograph, right? Um, so we go back, and there's a party, and all the main man crew are there. You know, and, and, and I met Lou Reed later through the main man crew because they looked after uh, at Lou. So um, anyway, you know, Mick disappears, he chains, he comes down, and he sees the sleeping bags, you know. And we're really shy just in the corner, you know, this food got him fucking starving. But, and there's all food, and I'd never seen sandwiches on a silver tray and all that. And I was like, and I nicked a sandwich because I thought, you know, I, I wouldn't be allowed to take one. It was just insecurity. Yeah. So Mick comes over and he goes, it's sleeping bag. I says, oh yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna sleep on the coach floor, you know. But, you know, thanks. I, I was just in awe. So he disappears, and he comes back with a hotel key. Give over. Oh. I'd never been in a hotel in my life. I'd been in a caravan in Blackpool. And so here's how naive I was, Brian. When the party finally finished, went to the room. In the morning, I made the bed because I thought it would make a good impression. <laughs> I swear to God, I didn't know that people come round and clean the beds or do. Uh, and I thought, you know. He'll know that I made the bed, and he'll yeah. know that I'm 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 okay. I'm a good guy. You yeah. Know? Um, so that was that's how I I met Mick, and the next day, uh, they were going back to London, and he he gave me his phone number, oh. and I was like stunned, and so I, and I was like I'm I'm in a band, all stuttering, you know. I said I'm in a band, and it's called Slaughter the Dogs, and he smiled because obviously oh, yeah. saw on Tenth Avenue, and he said and in in a whole accent he goes that's great, Mick. That's great. And I know you're a guitar player because you told me last night. I says, yeah, yeah, you know. And he just said, well, keep playing and, you know, we'll stay in touch. Wow. I was fucking floored. So what I used to do is, is my, back then when phone calls, like calling London from Manchester was like calling New York, you know. Uh, so my mum would um, go to bed and I'd sneak the phone because they were always in the hallway under the <laughs> stairs, you know. So I'd sneak the phone and pull it in the living room and I'd call Mick and I'd say, we just did a gig. Or... So when we got our first record deal to do Do It Dog Style, I called him up and I says, uh, we just got a record deal, Mick. And he was so thrilled. Oh. And I said, and, and I just bought a real Les Paul. And, and so innocently, I said, you should play on the record. And he says, okay. And I didn't realize the magnitude of that. Yeah. It, it just didn't compute. So we go down to London. We recorded, the irony again, we recorded the album where Bowie recorded Diamond Dogs, Summer oh. Diamond Dogs. Um, so Mick comes down, and it's the first time I'd seen a boogie amp. So he brings a boogie amp down, and then he looks at my Marshall. And I had no I, I just turned everything up, because again, I just wasn't refined enough. So Mick says, oh, I'll use your Marshall. And he goes in and goes like this, and there's the Ziggy sound. I'm like, fucking hell. So 
we played on two tracks and um, it was amazing, a dream come true and, and we became friends and uh, I went to stay with Mick in New York, he lived in Woodstock and uh, I met Ian Hunter through Mick and Lou Reed and all those main, main man people and uh, he was, he was uh, a dear friend up until he passed, you know. Well, so. incredible. So, so yeah, Mick Ronson played on the record, that must have been incredible. Yeah. Um, talking of the record then, um, like the Pistols, the recording career was, was short, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was. Um, everything was happening so fast uh, and the whole nation was moving as one. So there was a lot of bands popping up, as I said earlier, and certainly we were moving at a, at a fast pace. And then out the blue, the singer just left the band. Um, we played, uh, we went to Paris. Um, we were doing a European tour and we did the Paradiso in Amsterdam. And we were doing five nights at this club called Jibu's in Paris. And he met this, uh, this uh, girl, woman, and he just uh, left us in the lurch, man, just fucked right off. Um, so, you know, it was one of those things. Uh, uh, so we found ourselves without a singer, uh, and we were contracted to do another record, um, which is uh, Slaunt the Dog's Bite Back album. And we had uh, Utopia Studios booked in London, and we said to the record company, uh, um, look, the singer's fucked off. He's just, uh, he's just done a run, he met this chick, which was a real bullshit move to do, you know, because we were all so young and, and, and we had a real shot, you know. So then Utopia Studios says, uh, well, you still have to pay for the studio time because the Three Degrees had it booked, wanted it, and we said no to the Three Degrees because Slaughter the Dogs were coming in. So then the record company came back to us and we were like kids and says... Uh, who was the label at this point? It was DJM Records, which is Dick James Music, right. who had signed... Uh, it's a funny story, actually, because when the Beatles were try when trying he, to sell he, their he publishing... Had, he, he owned their publishing. Yeah, because what, yeah. what happened is um, Brian Epstein was trying to get a publishing deal yeah. and everyone turned him down. And they says, you know what, there's a guy around the, you know, up the street, his name's Dick James, he'll have your publishing. He yeah. bought their publishing and the rest is history. Mm. So Dick James had a label and Elton John was on the label, right. you know, so there was, there was a couple of heavy hitters on the label. And so they said to us, um, you still owe for the studio time, that's going to go on your bill. And it was like, you know, 20,000, 30,000 pounds or whatever it was, you know. And then um, Ed Banger and Nosebleeds, who was roading for us at the pistol sh gig in the free trade hall. He'd, he'd always been on the scene and we always liked him, a great guy. And uh, we said, what about Eddie? He sings great. So we called Eddie up and we said, listen, man, singer's fucked off. And he's like, I'm in. So we, we literally wrote the album very quickly, but it, it happened very, very quickly. And, and these songs were just, just uh, uh, happening. So a couple of weeks and there we had the record. And then, um, because we could all play a little better then, I, I called uh, Mick up and, and um, says, could I use your boogie amp? Because the, the boogie amp was the, it was the first one he had in, in London. They were American made. So he let me have that. And then I, um, I called up Dale Griffin from Mott the Hoople, the drummer who had mixed Mott Live in New York. And I thought, oh, that's a really good job. So I called him up and I says, listen, you don't know me. My name's Mick, I'm the guitarist. Uh, uh, from Slaunt the Dogs and I want you to produce our second album. I said, I, I won't be offended if you, if you say no. So he came down to rehearsal, uh, liked what he heard and says, you know, I'll do it. So then I, I was speaking to um, Ian Hunter and I says, Look, you know, we want to get a keyboard player in here. And he says, well, you should give Morgan, a fi uh, Morgan Fisher from Mott the Hoople and later play with Queen as the keyboard player. So I called him up and he said he'd do it. And so we found ourselves very quickly with Mott the Hoople producing the record, or one of them, with Mott the Hoople keyboard player. And Eddie, he brought, you know, he had something to prove, so he brought such energy and commitment to it. And so it, it, we found ourselves in, in, uh, from a position of weakness in a position of strength. But it was funny, Brian, because 
this was, I think, 1980. And so Buffin, the drummer from Mott, he would come in every day and he had the Cuban heel boots on. And he had a different finish every day. So the first was maroon. That was Monday's pair. Tuesday's pair was blue. Then it was green. And then Sunday, I couldn't hold back. So I had to let him have it. Marble finish, Cuban heel. And I said, for fuck's sake, Dale, the boots have got to go. He's like, what? What? <laughs> Fucking handmade boots, you know. But he still looked like he was in Mott the Hoople. <laughs> so, yeah, that was the second album. And, and we toured with that. We had a very successful tour. And then it kind of came to a natural finish. Yeah, and probably at the right time, wasn't it? I mean, that was kind of... Well, all that first generation of punk bands had gone by in the damned, I suppose. Yeah. But they'd all gone by then, really, hadn't they? Yeah, yeah. And, but... Well, I mean, wasn't that the nature of the beast, though, wasn't it? Live fast, die young sort of vibe, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, that, that was our, our motto. You know, we, we, really, we really didn't think beyond... We didn't look at a, a plan and, and say, OK, this is the longevity of the band, because it was just happening in the now, in the moment. Um, and, and it felt natural when it stopped. You know, I, I wasn't uh, uh, upset. I, I think I went off and did an album with uh, Gary Holton, was in a band called the Heavy Metal Kids. Yeah, yeah, it was in those things in Pat, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I... Uh, well, I didn't know you'd work with them. Yeah, I did an album. Nice I album learned something with... in every one of these interviews, I learned something. Yeah, That's great. well, cool, man. I was a massive fan of his, in those feeders in Pat. He's passed away as well, hasn't he? Yeah, I know, yeah. It's, uh, it's funny, it was... Because um, Gary, um, Gary was about the scene in London, and after Slaughter the Dogs, I formed a band called The Duelists, a uh, good rock and roll band, and Gary used to come to the gigs. And we kind of met that way. And, you know, our friendship started to grow. And then he says, uh, what are you doing next week? I says, uh, nothing. He goes, well, come over to the house. You know, maybe we'll do a bit of writing. So I was like, OK. And he lived in, uh, near Chiswick, I think. And he had a beautiful girlfriend who was a model. Susie, her name was. Really sweet. So I remember going over to the house. And, we, you know, we're just kind of kicking some chords around, um, writing a few tunes. And he, the door went, and he, he goes, oh, that, that'll be Ronnie, get the door. And I was like, who's Ronnie? Ron, fucking gas man or something? <laughs> so I opened the door, and it's Ronnie Wood. No way. Right. And Ronnie Wood comes, and he's like, all right. And in my mind, I'm like, it's fucking Ronnie Wood. <laughs> right? And so I spent the night with Gary writing songs, Ronnie jamming. Um, it was just surreal. And I said to Ronnie, where do you live? And he goes, Richmond. And he says, uh, I think I said, did you get the tube or something? He goes, no, I've got a driver outside. Yeah. But the driver was outside for like all night. <laughs> I remember leaving at like four in the morning. Um, and my jaw was clinched quite a lot. And that's all <laughs> I say. Um, and I'm thinking, another surreal night. <laughs> so anyway, Gary and I hit it off. And um, I remember uh, he'd had a few hits in Norway. And so he said, look, I'm, I'm shooting Alvida saying, you fly, go into, fly into Norway. We had the album written and, and he says, uh, fly into the studio in Oslo in Norway, um, get the backing tracks down and then I'll, uh, I'll come in like a week later and lay the vocals down. So I get to the studio and it was a, a band that Gary had had, uh, not his band, I think there were session musicians. So I walk into the studio and they're all like, they're off a, a trawler. Big, big fucking polar necks on and Nordic beards and hair, you know. And I walked in and they're playing the deer hunter, note perfect. And I got so insecure because I'm like, fucking hell, they're real musicians. Like, I can't do that. And, and I, got, I got like these nerves on me because the songs we had were like the faces, you know, the album was called Sing It To Me, just a cool rock and roll album. But what I found is, is uh, once my nerves settled, I was trying to get the band to, they were so good that they lacked feel because it was perfect every time. Yeah. So I'm kind of like, no, it needs to be a little looser. You know, eventually we got there. But uh, so we ended up doing the album in Norway and um, we did a, a whole bunch of gigs in, in, uh, in around London. And, and we had uh, Glenn Matlock on bass, actually. Oh. Glenn, Glenn jumped in on a few songs for us. So... Uh, yeah, great, great memories of working with Gary. Loved him, great actor. Uh, he was the real deal as a singer too. Was he? Total real deal. 
I mean, uh, heavy metal kids were great at their time. Um, and Gary was the real deal and uh, another, another one taken too soon. Yeah, for sure. Now, as we, we've uh, mentioned earlier in the interview, or earlier in the chat, you know, you grew up on a, a council estate in Manchester, Withenshaw. Mm -hmm. So people are going to wonder then, what the fuck's going on with that accent? So this mid-Atlantic, explain to, I mean, obviously I know why, but explain to the viewers why you have this mid-Atlantic accent. You all right, what accent? <laughs> sound that, man. Fucking hell. Well, no, I've, I've lived in, um, see, to me, it doesn't sound weird. Oh, it, well, I wouldn't say weird, it, but it like I said, mid-Atlantic is. It, it's, it's funny, you know, when, when I, well, growing up in, 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 in a council estate in, in Withenshaw, it's a fucking tough life, man. So mm. in your mind, you want to get out. You want to get, I mean, my father was an alcoholic and he used to, you know, violence towards my mum, used to beat me up. So my, my whole thing was, I want to get out. I want to, and you almost want to divorce yourself from everything. Uh, uh, um, but when you get older, you realize that, that uh, you know, the place where you came from actually f forms the character within you and makes you who you are, you know, the good and the bad. So I've lived in, in Los Angeles for, 25 years, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, you naturally pick up the sounds. I also, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, that, that's all I was alluding to. The fact you live in LA is why you talk like that. I'm not suggesting you put it on or No, 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 not at all. <laughs> no. Because I, I also, um, you know, I, I act in movies, period, if I'm lucky enough to get a job in a mm -hmm. movie. And so I remember the first job I auditioned for, it was a TV show. And it was for a New York gun dealer. So if you go in and go, all right, come for New York gun dealer. Where do you want me? Yeah. You, you fucked, you're dead in the water. <laughs> because there's 200 guys in the waiting room who are the real deal. Yeah, but I'm sure you'd be first in land though for the Mancunian Scully though, you're wouldn't you? Fucking right, I get that down like, like that. <laughs> so what I did, I made a conscious effort to try and home in, like, like Tim Roth did and Gary Oldman. Yeah, yeah. When they first went over there, you know, they were playing Americans and yeah. when Tim did uh, uh, Reservoir Dogs. Yeah, of course, yeah. You know, and, then, and Gary did a... Home... And a lot of Americans to this day still don't realise he's English. I know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I made a conscious effort to actually try and work on an American accent right. so that when I, you know, if, if I got work and the character was American or, or from the Midwest or something, I have at least a bit of a shot of, of it sounding yeah. authentic. Yeah. So things stick with you. Yeah. And it's funny, before my mum passed, she, I would call her and she'd go, you sound dead posh. Yeah. I'm like, fucking posh. Yeah. So anyway, it's, so yeah. if there's a bit of a twang there. Of course, it's because you're in California. For 20 you're years. really weird. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, That's Johnny Depp. So how did you end, uh, the other question, how did you end up in California? Why did you go to Los Angeles? Um, well, my wife uh, um, is an actor, and uh, Sheila, who you know, you yes. will know. Yes. And uh, I, I really had a passion for acting when I was young too. I remember seeing uh, Al Pacino in a movie called Panic in Needle Park. It's a really raw indie movie. And I thought, fucking hell, man, that's incredible. But I was always too embarrassed, certainly coming from Withenshaw, to say, that, you know, I wouldn't mind having a shot at acting. Because you say that and they'd be like, fucking acting, why don't yeah. be a drug dealer like everyone else? Yeah. Because that's what it was, so. So when, um, you know, when Sheila and I um, were talking about, you know, possibly going there and giving it a go. You Where's know, Sheila from? She's Dublin. She's Irish. Right, so, yeah, so, of course, yeah. So, you know, and I, I lived in, in Dublin for, for a while with Sheila. And then we, and I'd been to LA a bunch of times. And I was seduced by it. You know, mm. you, you just are. Because as a kid, I, we only had like four TV channels. Yeah. But my window into America was looking at Kojak or the streets of San Francisco. Yeah. I'd never seen wide streets. Yeah. I'd never seen par palm trees and cars with, with the fucking bonnet and eight, eight foot long, you yeah. know? So, so, so going there for the first time, I was totally seduced by it. Yeah. Um, and plus there's a, like, a ton of my friends live there. A lot of English yeah, people yeah. live there. Steve, Steve Jones, Jones lived yeah. there. Have you been Duffy on his radio show? Say it again? We've been on his radio show. Yeah, I've done it a couple of times, that, yeah. I must have a look at that. Um, yeah. So, uh, so we just said, you know what, why don't we give it a go? Because uh, I wouldn't mind giving this acting lark a, a shot, you know. 
And then I started to, I couldn't get a job as an actor because it was all that was on offer was drug dealer number one, you know. And I always thought, yeah, I'd like to try and do something better than that. And so I started writing uh, screenplays and I'd never trained. And I eventually wrote one where I put myself in it as the main actor. Uh, and we did it punk rock style, me and my writing partner. He directed it and I was in it. And the movie got in the Cannes Film Festival. Wow. And, and since then, we've done three independent movies outside. It's, it's, the, it's like punk, the punk rock approach. Mm. So that was why I ended up in, in the States. And, and for a while, you know, music was on the back burner. Um, and so the accent, you kind of pick it up a bit. Yeah, of course. But I can slip back into it. <laughs> no, you can. Oh, like I, can say, I wasn't suggesting you No, I know, I know that, yeah. <laughs> Explain yeah. to people who think, hang on, he's from Willie Show. Why does he talk like that? Because you've lived in LA for 20 years. I remember, years. though, because things are said differently there, right? I remember going to a sandwich shop because I just fancied a butty. <laughs> and I said, have you got any balm cakes? And he looked oh, at me yeah, like I was yeah, a yeah. fucking alien. <laughs> they would do round here. Yeah. You said but that. remember the balm cakes? Yeah, of course. The balm cake was this. Red roll. Yeah, but like a. A glove. It was yeah. huge, like yeah, a yeah. disc. With flour on top. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, you, you live there long enough, you, you pick yeah. certain sounds up. So what are you up to these days then? Well, um, I got a new band called Mick Rossi's Gun Street. Mick Rossi's? Gun Street. Gun Street. Yeah. And Gun Street, there's a, there's a, a meaning behind the name. Um, the Rosses, when in the 30s, and they emigrated from uh, Monte Cassino in Italy, and they settled in Ancoach just outside Manchester, and they lived on Gun Street. Wow. It's actually still there today. And uh, my granddad and my dad used to play on those cobbled streets. Uh, so I was looking for a name to do a new band, and it's really hard with a name because when they become famous, the names sound great yeah. automatically. There it is. It's, it could never be anything else. Yeah. Like Oasis, genius. You know? yeah, it but, could never be anything else. But if you've never heard of them, it's yeah. shite. Yeah. 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 Now, you know, I don't know if you sat around a table and you said, what have you got? Beatles? Yeah. I'm not sure on that one, mate. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I, 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 it's hard. So I was thinking of all these and I thought, no, that's too cheesy. That's too... And then I, I, I was back here in, in Manchester, and Moz Murray, a dear friend of mine and a promoter and a, just, just an all-round great guy, he said there's this photographer called David Gleave, and he does these uh, shots in and around Manchester. Um, he'd like to sh shoot some stuff here. This is a few years ago, and I was like, oh, I'd love to. So we ended up on Gun Street in Ancoats. Wow. And he did the shot, and that was the shot that's going to be on, on the cover for the record. Cool. And I think it's, it means something to me, obviously, but I think it's a cool name. So the album is recorded it. I, I, re I recorded it. The album's recorded. I, I recorded it in L.A., um, the studio I, I, I work in. And, and what I wanted to try and do, Brian, I wanted to try and go back to my roots and the music that had, had a, an effect on me as a kid. And what see because it never lose you never lose what's in your DNA it just doesn't it's always there so my sonics for the record just the sonics is Aladdin Sane and Slider so I studied the production on both those records and and then um, at the studio where I work he he rewired the studio um, so we could get to as close as analog as possible. And the studio uh, was, is the oldest standing studio. It was owned by Liberace. Oh. Um, Liberace had it. Brilliant. And then after Liberace had it, RCA had it as a Foley studio doing uh, you know, sound to movies. Then after that, uh, Zappa came through there. The Doors came through there. Wow. So it has great history, great studio. Um, so I recorded it there. We rewired the studio, so my blueprint for the Sonics was Aladdin, Sane, and Slider. And, and I started writing songs that, that, that really, tried to write songs that, that, when I was a kid, the songs that really had a profound effect on me. So it's kind of a good rock and roll album. It's not a punk rock album. It's a pop rock album. It's got a bit of glam in there. It's got a little Lou Reed. It's got, for me, you know, so I'm really proud of the record, and it's out on a secret records which is an indie label uh, based in London. 
on February the 23rd. I've got good label mates, Ian Hunter, Echo and the Bunny Man, so oh. I'm just uh, thrilled to um, have it out, you know. Excellent. I have a question for you, Mr. Ken. Oh, go on then. As you know, I'm a huge fan of your work. Thank you. I think your designs are legendary. A lot of pals are like, you're going to see Brian? Oh, he's fucking brilliant. How did you get the gig with Oasis? How did that happen? Well, there's a, a short and a long answer to that. The, um, the actual real answer is I... But I left college in 88 and I moved straight away to London because that's where it was happening. Where was you living prior to that? I was in Leeds, in Le doing okay. my degree in Leeds. Okay. Leeds Poly, as right. it was then. Yeah. And I moved to London in 88 uh, to take over the world as a graphic designer doing record sleeves and I just didn't get any work. No, I, I don't know what I was thinking. You right. know what I mean? <laughs> but again, it was all corporate. You, you, how, yeah. how could you get break down those barriers? I did. Right? I got a foot in the door, th and I, I was doing some stuff for EMI. But it was few and far between, and nobody really took me seriously. And I stayed in London until 1990. And I found myself um, in the, in the late eight, in 89. I was in Manchester every weekend going to the Hacienda. So you travel up from London? Yeah, yeah. To the, and the Hacienda back then, a lot of people don't... Mad man. A lot, a lot of people back then don't realise, it, it never opened past 2 a.m. Right. It was never an all-nighter. Right. It was 9, 9 p.m. till 2 a.m. Uh -huh. Right. And I was going every week, and I thought, fuck this, what, what, I might as well move to Manchester. So I relocated myself, the business. <laughs> Bear in mind, all the record companies were So London. was it based on you just going up to hang out at Hacienda? That's how it all started, wow. the Manchester connection. So wow. I moved to fucking Manchester just to go to this nightclub. Yeah, night, yeah. Night to do with business. Insane. Brilliant. And then I needed to get myself um, a studio in Manchester. And all I could afford was this tiny, tiny room in the basement of this converted cotton mill on Roch bottom end of Rochdale Road called, it was, it was, it was rebranded as 23 New Mount Street. Right. right? And I think, uh, and we're in that building, like I said, I had this tiny little room that was 25 quid a week. There was no windows in it. It was like a dungeon. It was a, it was a, a design studio with no windows in it. Right? But it's all I could afford. Like you're doing a 10 stretch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but in the same building was the band, the Inspiral Carpets. Sure, yeah. And they had a guitar tech come roady, come gopher called Noel Gallagher. And that's how I met him. And he was in, we got chatting in the lift about trainers, basically, because I was wearing some obscure trainers that I bought in Italy when I took my mum to Rome for his 60th birthday. Right, right. And uh, he got wind of the fact I did all these record sleeves. But before I did anything for Oasis, because Oasis weren't signed then, this was 92. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. He only got signed in the middle of 93. He recommended to the Inspiral Carpets that I do their artwork. So Noel did? Yeah, yeah, he got, he got me that love gig. It. Love it. He got me that gig. Yeah, yeah. And then they ultimately sacked him for taking drugs on tour, basically. Which, I mean, can you imagine that? A band sacking the drone for taking drugs. Imagine drug. that. Yeah. Drugs on tour. So, Shameful, Noel. So they sacked him and uh, Mark Coyle, who was working with, who went on to be the Oasis sound, sound guy. Sound guy, yeah, yeah. And then after the sacking, Oasis was signed in Glasgow by Alan McGee. Yeah, no, Alan, very well. And he comes back and says, yeah. you know, I want you to do that right work now. So that's how that happened. And the rest is history. Yeah, so, you know, it's all into, there's loads, it, all, it all goes back to seeing Buzzcocks on top of the Pops in 1978, yeah. if you want to be literal about yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, you know. Six degrees of separation. It's, it's all, it, it, all every, it all links together. But. Well, as you know, you know, I'm a huge fan of yours. I, I think Noel is a genius. I think Liam is a genius. And yeah. uh, I'm a huge, huge fan. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be here at the Microdot Nerve Center. Well, you know, I'm a... Like I said, I'm a huge fan of Slaughter of the Dogs and just to be friends with you now, I call an honour. And to have you in here is, a, is an equally, equally big honour. So uh, um, thank you, Mick Rossi. My Rossi. pleasure, Brian. Nice one. Thanks, pal. Well, I enjoyed yeah. that. Nice one. That's a wrap.